Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Latin American Webinar for Physics. Uh, I am Roberto Linero from Instituto de Física Corpuscular in Valencia, in Spain, and I will be, will be the host of the first webinar of the session two, which is, in fact, the 10th webinar of the series. So today we have a very interesting talk in the line of neutrinos and LHC signatures. But before the, the start with the talk itself, I want to tell you about how to contact us. In case, if you want to help, if you want to make questions, you can use the Q&A system and the hashtag LayOP in Twitter. You can see here in this part of the screen. And if you want to contact it, in case if you want to give us some comments or you're interested to give a seminar, a webinar, you can contact us here uh, to Twitter or via email to this Gmail address. So now we start again. We pass with Joel, that is going to be the speaker. He is, he is from Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, where he is currently professor there and at his institution. He obtained a PhD at the University of Valencia. And after that, he realized a postdoc at INFN in Frascati in Italy. And after that, a postdoc at CERN, thanks to the Valencian program Val Imaste. So, his title is Proving the Type 1 CISO Mechanism with Displaced Vertices at LAC. And I guess now, Joel, you can you have all the power on the on the webinars. Please. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Everybody can see me. So let's uh, let me try to share my screen. So uh, I'll share the, my desktop. And here we go. OK, so everything's OK? Everybody can see this? Yes, we can see okay, it. OK, fantastic. So thanks, everybody, for, for being here. Um, my, my talk is titled Probing the Type 1 CISO Mechanism with Displaced Vertices at the LHC. It's a work already on the archive and has been uh, submitted for, for publication. And uh, it has been done in collaboration with Alberto Gago, Pilar Hernandez, Marta Lozada, and Alex Moreno. So uh, this, this talk is based on a CISO model, a type 1 CISO model, called the 3 plus 2 minimal neutrino model. It's basically a type 1 CISO with just two heavy fermionic singlets that we call right-handed neutrinos, or sometimes sterile neutrinos. You can see the Lagrangian uh, from the model right in front of you. So basically, you have the standard model Lagrangian. You add a kinetic term for the sterile neutrinos. Furthermore, you are adding a Yukawa coupling between the active neutrinos, the heavy neutrinos, and the Higgs. And finally, a Majorana mass term for the sterile neutrinos. Uh, you proceed, uh, the, the, the procedure is standard, right? So after electroweak symmetry breaking, you can reconstruct the CISO mass matrix. And then a diagonalization of this, um, of this matrix gives you um, a, a mass matrix for the light neutrinos that follows more or less this, this structure. So mainly the idea here is that the... Uh, lightness of the of the neutrinos that we observe is due to the heaviness of the sterile neutrinos. So after the diagonalization, uh, we initially have well, the three active neutrinos and the two sterile neutrinos. So after the diagonalization, we get one massless neutrino because we're only adding two heavy neutrinos. So one, uh, light, one, one active becomes uh, massless. We have two light neutrinos and two uh, heavy ones. The two light ones are mostly active. The two heavy ones are mostly sterile, but they have uh, mixed components. This mixing is described by the, the five times five mixing matrix, which is decomposed into four blocks as shown on the right side of the, of the slide. So we have a, a mixing between the actives and the lights, right, which is the upper left part. You have a mixing between the actives and the heavies, the sterile and the lights, the sterile and the heavies. Okay, so how can we actually test this, this model? We, um, 
in order to test it, what we should do is we should actually, okay, after uh, observing the heavy neutrinos, we should observe the coupling between the Higgs bosons, the active neutrinos, and the heavy neutrinos. Right? This is the, like the ultimate test for the CISOMOR. And nevertheless, uh, this is uh, generally expected to be impossible. Right? The standard law is that if we want to make uh, the uh, Yukawa couplings large, then the singlet masses must be uh, unreachable. Right? So here's again the neutrino mass matrix, and, and, and here we can see that if the Yukawas are of order one, then the neutrino masses need to, the right-handed neutrino masses need to, to increase in order to uh, keep the light neutrino masses uh, small enough. Right? So then one would expect the CISO mechanism to be impossible to, to test. If one makes the, the heavy neutrinos light enough, then the Yukawa couplings are too small and the coupling is unmeasurable. We're going to argue that this is not the general case. There are, there are uh, specific models, that, uh, specific realizations of the model, where uh, you can actually have light masses and uh, large couplings too. Uh, so then the question is, if these heavy neutrinos are light enough, such that they could be produced at LHC energies, then is it actually possible to measure their coupling with the Higgs balls, right? So this is the, the main objective of this work. So this is the outline of the talk. So first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about the parameter space of the model. Uh, then we shall apply some constraints on it. And then we'll go into the observables that we're interested in. Namely, we shall uh, study uh, the Higgs decays into heavy neutrinos. So we'll assume that the heavy neutrinos are lighter than the Higgs. And then we shall uh, concentrate on the decay of the heavy neutrinos in, uh, through uh, displaced verti vertices, through displaced vertex signal. So um, this is a parameter space. Well, these are the blocks that we care about in the parameter space. Right, so here we have the active light mixing and the active heavy mixing. And we see several components here. So first of all, we have a unitary mixing matrix, UPMNS. Um, and we have also a Hermitian matrix H, which will describe non-unitary effects in the active light mixing. The active light mixing is the one that we actually observe in neutrino oscillations, right? Uh, and generally, it can be very well approximated by a unitary mixing matrix, just a PMNS matrix, right? The Hermitian matrix A shall uh, generally be almost uh, the identity matrix. Uh, furthermore, on the active heavy mixing, we find the two diagonal two times two mass matrices. So ML has got uh, the light neutrino masses, and MH has got the heavy neutrino masses. So here we see the suppression uh, appearing in the active heavy mixing. We see that the suppression goes uh, like the light mass over the heavy mass uh, square root of that. Okay, So this is the main suppression that we get in the active heavy mixing. It's a very strong suppression. Uh, finally, we find a complex orthogonal matrix. This can be parametrized uh, through the sine and cosine of a complex angle. The real part of, the co of this complex angle we call theta 4 5, and the imaginary part of this complex angle we call gamma 4 5. And it's this, it, it's this gamma 4 5, the, the most important part of this, of, of this model. Um, if we have an imaginary angle, then the sines and cosines shall be related to hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines. So that means that we can get an exponential enhancement on the active heavy mixing. So the, the idea is if we enhance gamma 4, 5, then we can get an exponential enhancement to the active heavy mixing. Uh, now let's understand this a bit better. Um, we can go to the limit where gamma 4, 5 is large and where the H matrix is identical to the uh, identity matrix. 
Okay, so in this case, if we have gamma 4, 5 large, say larger than 3, and H approximately the identity matrix, we can write weight. So here we see that we have the exponential enhancement due to the hyperbolic cosine of gamma 4, 5. We also see the suppression where we find the square root of the light neutrino masses. In, in this case, it's M3, which is equal to the square root of the atmospheric uh, uh, mass difference. And that is divided by each of the heavy masses. We also see that there's no uh, relevant roles for theta 4, 5. It's just a phase, right? So since we're going to be taking the moduli of this mixing, then this phase shall be or shall disappear entirely. And finally, we have this z factor, which is more or less an order one. It depends on the on the mixing angles and on the ratio between the, the masses. Okay, so it's a very easy uh, way to understand how the active heavy mixing behaves. Nevertheless, in this work, we shall use the full uh, active uh, heavy mixing uh, matrix. Uh, the story is the same for the Yukawa couplings. One can rebuild them and one can see that they have this, this shape. That term that we care about is this one. Uh, so we can see that if we want to increase the size of the Yukawa couplings, we need either to increase the heavy masses or we need to increase uh, the, uh, the parameters within the R matrix. Okay, so since we want to keep uh, MH small enough, then what we need to do is increase R. So in the, the same, the same uh, as before, we can uh, increase gamma 4, 5 and take H uh, similar to the identity and we can reconstruct the Yukawa matrix and, and, and prove that they have more or less this shape. So again, we see directly that we can maximize this by maximizing gamma 4, 5. So that's going to be our objective from now on. We're going to try to maximize gamma 4, 5. So what kind of structure does this lead us into? So we, we can prove that for a large gamma 4, 5 and degenerate Majorana masses, we can perform a change of basis and they write the, uh, the neutrino mass matrix as an inverse CISO-like matrix. So this more or less explains why we're having these uh, very large Yukawas and these light masses. This situation is common in, an, in inverse CISO scenarios. If we do not have a degenerate Majorana masses, we can still write it in a similar way. Uh, in this case, we find we have a, a, a large-ish element on the, say, 2-2 a part of, um, of the matrix. So we have an extended CISO-like uh, structure. All of these structures can be justified by assuming, say, a lepton number symmetry at the high scale, which is at some point broken, right? So the mu and mu prime parameters are those that, that can break this, this lepton number. Okay, so let's go into the constraints. Uh, first of all, we shall consider neutrino less double beta decay. Then we shall take into account lepton flavor violation and direct searches. Even though loop corrections are also important, uh, we shall not uh, take them into account as they will be uh, taken care of when we solve the, the constraints of neutrino less double beta decay. So let's go uh, on the, uh, with the first constraint. Uh, we find that the non-observation of this process can constrain very strongly gamma 4, 5. So the plot here shows uh, the, the space of the two heavy masses, M1 and M2. And the contours indicate the maximum value that gamma 4, 5 can have, uh, provided that the neutrino less double beta de uh, decay is not observed. So we see that for light uh, heavy neutrinos, uh, the maximum value of gamma 4, 5 we can have is about, say, 5 or 6. That will not be very good. Nevertheless, if we go to the limit where M1 is equal to M2, so, so we go to the diagonal of this line, 
we see that the, the bounds are greatly weakened, and we can go to gamma 4, 5 larger than 10. So that's more or less what we're going to do. The, the, the reason for this is that when we go to uh, degenerate neutrino, neutrino masses, we only have one, uh, one parameter breaking um, lepton number. And that is the one that will, well, that will give the light neutrinos their mass. So the contribution to neutrinoless double beta decay shall always be proportional to this number. Okay, so here we have the situation in, in formulas, right? So, so here uh, in this uh, capital M beta beta, we have the uh, lowercase beta beta, which is a standard contribution to neutrino, neutrinoless double beta decay from light neutrinos. And then the second term gives us that contribution from the heavy ones. Uh, on the square brackets, we see why gamma 4, 5 is so strongly constrained, right? We see here that we also have an exponential enhancement. Uh, these terms are smallish terms that we don't really need to worry about too much right now. But we see that multiplying the square brackets, we have this delta M term. And that is the difference between the matrix elements. So when the, the two uh, neutrino masses are equal, this term vanishes, and the neutrino less double beta decay uh, be, uh, is under control. This again is due to this uh, to having only one parameter uh, breaking lepton number. So that's why we still get the m beta beta contribution. All right, so this is one situation that we're going to, to face. So what we're going to do is we're going to set M1 equal to M2 for definiteness. Thus, the only parameters that we care about are M1 and gamma 4, 5. So the active heavy mixing becomes the same, both for the neutrino, say, 1 and the neutrino 2. OK, now comes lepton flare violation. We see that here, again, we have an enhancement for the processes. So the processes we care about are, are uh, those like mu e gamma decay and the mu e conversion in nuclei. And here we get a bound even if the neutrinos are degenerate. On the plot, we see um, the rates for mu e conversion, which imposes the most stringent constraint on our parameter space. The current bound, which comes from the um, syndrome experiment with, with gold, um, doesn't allow gamma 4, 5 to be larger than 10. In the future, uh, maybe the mu 2e experiment and the comet experiment, I believe, shall try to, ex to probe um, mu e conversion using aluminum and uh, Given their expectations, we might be able to bound gamma 4, 5 up to values of 8, more or less. OK, so that's an important constraint that needs to be taken into account. Nevertheless, the most important constraint is the one that comes from direct searches. Here we have uh, many experiments that have tried to directly produce the heavy neutrinos. Uh, the important constraints for our work will be those, for instance, of CHARM and DELPHI. Uh, here we see that we are constraining uh, the, the mixing between the electron neutrino and the lightest heavy neutrino, right? So we have put here UE4 squared. We also have uh, analogous constraints for um, the mixing between the muon neutrino and the heavy neutrinos. And what we find is that in, in our model, um, this is the most stringent one, right? The, the, the bound on the mixing between the muon and the uh, heavy neutrinos. So this is the one that we're going to use in the following, as it is. OK, so these are the constraints that we're imposing. Let's now have a look at Higgs decays. So possible, possible scenarios are the Higgs decaying into two uh, light neutrinos, the Higgs decaying into a light neutrino and a heavy neutrino, or uh, the Higgs decaying into two heavy neutrinos. And what we find is that the largest uh, contribution to the Higgs branching ratios 
comes from a Higgs going into one light neutrino and one heavy neutrino, right? So here is uh, the partial width for, for this decay. It might give you the impression that this, uh, this decay will be proportional to uh, the heavy neutrino mass divided by the W mass squared, right? Since it, there's a term like that uh, right in front of it. Nevertheless, there's a Cij term, which is a, a matrix, and from there one sees that one gets a suppression uh, that goes like the heavy neutrino mass. So at the end of the day, what one observes is that this process shall be proportional to one power of the light neutrino mass, one power of the heavy neutrino mass divided by the W mass squared. Uh, this is a very strong suppression. Nevertheless, it's the least suppressed of all of the decays. And it can be enhanced by gamma 4, 5, as we see that the R matrix is appearing there. So this is a decay that we're going to, to explore. Uh, now we'll, we'll see uh, the values of the branching ratio within the parameter space. So here we have, again, the mixing between uh, the active muon neutrino and the uh, and neutrino 4, say, uh, versus the heavy neutrino mass. Uh, the blue region is excluded by direct searches, as I showed you before, and the red region is excluded by mu A conversion in gold. So we see that uh, these exclusion regions uh, don't allow us to have branching ratios larger than 10 to the minus 2. Right, so we're talking about small branching ratios here. Um, we, we can see branching ratios as low as 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6. This shall not worry us too much, as uh, 10 to the minus 4 is the branching ratio for Higgs decay into two muons, and we expect to be able to measure that at the LHC. Right? We shall uh, consider branching ratios as small as 10 to the minus 5 in the following. Okay, so that's that. Now, which channel are we going to choose? What we're going to, to do is we're going to have the Higgs decaying into a light neutrino and a heavy neutrino, and then we shall allow the neutrino to travel a macroscopic distance uh, between uh, one millimeter and one meter. And then the heavy neutrino shall decay. This is an example of what you see on the screen. You can see a decay into a charged lepton and two jets. So in this case, for example, uh, the signature would be Higgs going into charged lepton, two jets, missing energy from the initial light neutrino, and the displaced vertex. Now the question is, where, uh, in what part of the parameter space can we actually measure this sort of signature? Um, and how to actually model it, right? Now, the, uh, doing, uh, we're trying to reproduce uh, displaced vertices is not very easy, right? Uh, generally, uh, one says, oh yeah, displaced vertices are background free, right? But this is not really, not really true. Uh, sometimes, in, in, in some cases, you, ha you have uh, interaction uh, normal standard model particles and the material within the detector. So if we want to do a serious study of this, we would need to simulate the whole detector. And that is something that was uh, beyond the scope of, of, of our work, right? We might want to, to do this eventually with, in collaboration with an, exp with an experiment, but for this work, we decided to stop and not do that, right? So we shall carry out a simpler analysis that will be, which can be used as a guide for uh, experimental collaborations. So they can actually put the appropriate triggers and cuts later. So the objective now is to first of all present the region of the parameter space where actually we can see displaced vertices, then study the branching ratios and see which channels are the, are the ones that would give us a larger number of events. And then we'll put some representative LHC cuts just to see uh, what happens. So first of all, for the first part of the study, 
if we use this formula to get the number of events with displaced vertices, right? So first of all, you see um, this is not as complicated as it looks. <laughs> this is basically a, a, a large integral that includes a Higgs production through gluon fusion and then the decay of the Higgs into a heavy neutrino and a light neutrino. Okay, so here we have in a L the LHC luminosity, which we take equal to 300 inverse femtobarns. Uh, the, the last term on the first line is a Higgs production a differential distribution, which depends on the Higgs transverse momentum and the Higgs rapidity. Uh, from the code sushi and the code more sushi combined. Then uh, we have the neutrino decay differential distribution, which, decay, which depends on the neutrino transverse momentum and the angle between the Higgs and the heavy neutrino transverse momenta. We also need to include some, some Lorentz factors there. And well, the neutrino decay distribution, we have calculated it by, by hand. Okay. Furthermore, we, we impose the, the allowed decay lengths using uh, heaviside uh, theta functions between one millimeter and one meter. So we use this formula and we find that the region of the parameter space that would lead us to having displaced vertices is the one that you're actually seeing on the screen. This, of course, doesn't involve the posterior neutrino decay. So it's kind of like a preliminary plot of what we're actually interested in. The red region has got more than 250 events, right? 250 Higgs decays into a heavy neutrino, giving us a displaced vertex at the LHC with 300 inverse femtons. The orange region is the same, but it will give us more than 50 events. The, the dashed line over there uh, is uh, the future prospect for mu -E conversion. So for instance, if, um, the, if we are actually, if nature decides to be, for instance, on the, on the dot that you see on the screen, which is a benchmark point that we use on the paper, uh, we would find a nice cross check between mu -E conversion and uh, the search for displaced vertices. So we would have an interplay between low energy and high energy uh, experiments. Okay, so that of course is not the end of the story. We need to make the neutrino decay. So first of all, we need to understand what are the neutrino branching ratios. So these are, these are all of the branching ratios that we have taken into account. Uh, and we shall choose one channel for, for definiteness. And the one that we shall choose is a decay into a muon and two, and two uh, jets. We did this because there was a similar analysis done by Atlas. Uh, and we tried to use it as a guide at that point. We later uh, found out that it wasn't uh, an appropriate guide, but, uh, but this, at least it will help us understand what the problems are with this signature, as we shall see in a moment. Okay, so in this case, the formula becomes slightly more complicated, but not, not too bad. The upper part of the formula you have seen, we have the Higgs production and decay again. Uh, the lower part has got the heavy neutrino decay distribution. This one is a bit more complicated, as, he, as in order to actually calculate this, this is a, a three-body uh, decay. Uh, we need to, to go into different frames at some point. So we need to, to do Lorentz transformations uh, within the, the differential distribution. It's, it's not a simple calculation. Nevertheless, we have done it analytically. And in the final part, we have a function that will impose all of the detector constraints. So our requirements on the displaced uh, vertex shall be within this function which uh, we can also impose the constraints from pseudo rapidity because of course not every part of the of the detector is sensitive to 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 um, uh, our final states and then we shall also put some other additional cuts there uh, just to to understand what's going on so if we do not impose any cuts at all this is the the situation Right? So here, uh, the only difference that we have with respect 
to the previous plot is that we're adding the branching ratio for, from the neutrino into uh, one muon and two jets. Okay, this is the only difference. So the brown region has got more than 100 events and the green region has got more than 10 events. Okay, so this is a starting point. Now we're going to add uh, the constraints coming from the pseudo rapidity uh, constraints of the detectors, right? So we cannot allow the muons to have a pseudo rapidity larger than 2.4 and uh, the quarks, the jets, cannot have a pseudo-rapidity larger than 2.5, for instance. So if we impose those constraints, this, of, this region, of course, is reduced. Uh, we get this one. Uh, so we see that uh, only now a very small area of the parameter space has got more than 100 events, and most of them have got more than, more than 10. Now, it, it's... it's uh, absolutely uh, legal to ask, well, is 10 events uh, good enough? Of course, at this point, we, we don't really know. It depends on the posterior cuts and how the backgrounds uh, behave with, with those cuts. Nevertheless, if we manage to reduce uh, these cuts, then uh, say five, 10 events shall, is generally considered to be good enough. So what happens when we add cuts? Um, let's let's uh, suppose that we're adding a cut on the muon transverse momentum. And on this plot, we see uh, how the number of events changes as a function of the cut. Here we're adding, a, a, we're, we're sampling two values of the heavy neutrino mass. So the, the, yellow, the yellow dots have got a mass of 3 GV, the blue dots have got a mass of 15 GV. Right, so we see that they don't change very much. We see that the ratio of events uh, is decreased very strongly as we increase the cuts. For instance, if we impose a cut of 20 GeV on the PT of the muon, which is a typical trigger from the first run of the LHC, we see that our number of events is reduced down to 40%, right, which is not good at all. Uh, if we try instead to impose a 30 GeV cut on the uh, muon transverse momenta, which is uh, an expected cut for the run two of the LHC, we see that the number of events is reduced down to 20%. So if we initially had, say, 50 events, then we shall end up with 10, right? Which is not very good, considering that we are not adding any cuts on the... Uh, on the jets and the no uh, and no efficiencies, right? So the main conclusion is that these PT cuts are just too strong, right? We shall need to to require dedicated triggers for this kind of of signature. The study of such dedicated triggers was without, out of the scope of this work, as as I mentioned previously. Uh, we're actually doing some literature search and, uh, to see if we can actually propose some better um, some better triggers. Um, nevertheless, we did study uh, some other the, the impact of some other uh, constraints. For instance, a, a cut on the missing energy um, is much better. We see that we can impose a cut up to 40 GeV without reducing the number of events lower than 80 percent. Unfortunately, this is not good enough for triggering. This could be used for a posterior uh, analysis after the triggers. We also can apply cuts on the effective mass, which is the sum of all of the uh, uh, transverse momenta and the missing energy. And here we can go up to 80 GV without drastically reducing the number of events. Nevertheless, this is as far as we, as, as, as we, as we, uh, as we went. Right, so uh, a posterior analysis uh, should be done with much more detail in the future. So this is where we, where we stop, and let me conclude for now. Um, in total, we see that uh, we, if we want to actually test the CISO mechanism, uh, we want to test the Higgs and neutrino coupling. And if we actually want to generate these uh, heavy neutrinos at the GeV scale, there are some schemes where one can actually uh, enhance the coupling and avoid all constraints, constraints from neutrinoless double beta decay, lepton free relation, and direct searches. 
if the heavy neutrinos are have masses between say 2 and 20 GeV, the, the, the best way to actually see them is with displaced vertices. For heavier neutrinos, there are other possibilities. Now, this, as you have seen, will be very difficult to accomplish, but of course, the story has not been written yet. There are works coming out in studying other sort of models that have also got this problem of uh, having uh, two strong triggers, but, but displaced vertices. So maybe in, in the coming year, you might find some, some important progress done in this, and this observable might actually be observable soon. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Joel. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, Joel, for this interesting talk. So now it's time for questions. But before, just to remind to the public that is looking the watching the, the streaming of this video, of this uh, webinar, that they can you can make questions using the Google Plus Q and A if you enter to the Google Plus page, web page of the Latin American Webinars of Physics, or via Twitter with the this hashtag LAWOP. So now maybe we can start with the question from the people that are uh, participating of this Hangout. So I don't know if you can unmute yourself and make the questions. I have a question, Joel. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, in, in this parametric region that you focus where the even if neutrinos are degenerated, you avoid limits from neutrinos less than with a decay, right? Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, are they other, uh, are other lepton number violating signals also suppressed? For instance, for instance, like sine leptons plus two jets at LHC? In this yeah, I, I, would, I would expect so. I would expect so because um, here, what we're in this in this limit, what we are having are pseudo Dirac heavy neutrinos. So I understand that when whenever you have pseudo Dirac heavy neutrinos, all of these signatures uh, are erased. Yeah. So you will expect on, only have a, a different sign leptons at the LHC because you don't have the problem because your signal does not violate lepton number. But if you want yeah. to search for uh, two leptons plus two jets at the LHC, you, ca you could only search for, search for opposite sign lepton. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I wouldn't know how to actually get the, um, the same sign leptons uh, without having problems. Uh, with a neutrinoless L beta, and more importantly, with the loop corrections. The loop corrections are very strong. They're even stronger than the, um, than the bounds from neutrinoless L beta decay. Uh, nevertheless, the same thing applies. If you um, impose the, 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 the degenerate neutrino masses, then the loop corrections are also uh, avoided. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So someone else has a question for Joel. I don't know for the hangout. Okay. Anyway, I have some question for for Joel. So one is just the the, the rough estimator, which is the lowest value that you could have with this right-handed neutrino, the lowest and the highest possible in order to have observable effects. Uh, you mean the mass? Yeah, the mass. Yes, in the in the heavy yeah. states. Right, so, so it depends what kind of search you're, you're, you're doing, right? If you want to stick with displaced vertices, you want to the masses between 2 GeV and 20 GeV, right? Not only for this kind of search uh, for coming from Higgs decays, but also coming from a direct production or production through W decays, right? Uh, this is due to the, uh, the lifetime of the heavy neutrino. Now, if you have heavier neutrinos, there are other kind of signals that you might want to look out for, uh, like uh, decays, uh, direct decays uh, without a displaced vertex into, say, two charged leptons and missing energy. That has also been done. Uh, also, uh, other kind of, uh, kind of signals that have been studied is a decay into a charged lepton and two jets, for example. 
Uh, those involve uh, higher mass neutrinos, say higher, with masses higher than 50 GeV, more or less. And then, of course, for lower mass uh, neutrinos, you, 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 you have had uh, searches like the ones done before, um, like the NUTEV experiment and things like this, or Delphi, that can probe lower masses. Uh, I'm not sure if there's currently any experiment that can probe even lower masses. Maybe the SHIP experiment might be able to, to, to check lower masses, but I'm not really, really sure about that. That's more or less my understanding of the situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone else has a question? I, have, I still have many. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if Nicolás or Federico or Diego may have some questions, you can ask it now. Oh, anyway. So another question, because you, you were talking about the, if in case of you go to the heavier, heavier states, I mean, heavier than the stuff that you're, I mean, in the range that you are checking. I was wondering if it is possible to make an, a scheme, this is scheme compatible, for instance, with leptogenesis, in which at least one of these right. states has to be very heavy or something like that to, so, so I'm, I'm not very, very, uh, I don't know much about leptogenesis. What I understand is that I, I guess we, hello, hey, hi. I guess Joel went out of, out of uh, the connection, it seems that oh dear. he was talking uh, hello, hello. about a forbidden word. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me? Yeah, okay. I guess was the, the someone was avoiding that you speak about leptogenesis. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's uh, maybe it was one of my collaborators. <laughs> <They don't. laughs> so, so my understanding of leptogenesis, I don't really know much about about this, right? So, so my understanding is that in this region there is a possibility of having leptogenesis through oscillation of the heavy states. Uh, nevertheless, I think that in order to have a correct leptogenesis, you need smaller mixings. So I'm not really sure if it's actually possible. Smaller mixing is the one that we were trying to probe. Uh, so in that case, we would need a, a much higher luminosity to actually get down to the leptogenesis region. But I might be completely wrong here. <laughs> okay, so so let don't take my take my comments with a pinch of salt. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe we can pass now to the questions that are in the table. Let's start with. A uh, question from Diego Restrepo that he's asking, uh, do you have any definitive prediction for the flavor of the final charge lepton? Oh, right. So that depends on the hierarchy that you're in, right? So it depends if you're in normal hierarchy or inverted hierarchy. Uh, the results I presented for you are those for uh, the normal hierarchy. And here, due, just, just due to the structure of the PMNS matrix, which, which appears on the mixing, uh, the most important decay is due to is, is into muons, right? Uh, this changes if you go into into the inverted hierarchy. I unfortunately don't have any plot available for for that, but uh, but yeah, that 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 is hierarchy dependent. So mostly it's muons, right? Muons and taus. Those are the those are the 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 ones with the largest mixing in the normal hierarchy. Electrons are small. Okay, so okay, we did this question. So we have another question that is, uh, if it is possible to distinguish it, distinguish this frame from other, for instance, SUSI models in which you have broken their parity. In the case, the the right-handed neutrino, is, the role of the right-handed neutrino is, is taking the place by the neutralino. Yeah, in in this case, uh, a main difference I believe is that we have a missing energy, right? Um, so most of the R parity, the broken R parity searches I've seen are into basically jets, <laughs> right? Or or uh, maybe jets and charged leptons. Mm, this could be mimicked, I think, if you have uh, a neutrino, a light neutrino, on the final state. Um, yeah, this this is the only possibility I I can think about right now. 
Uh, nevertheless, they have never seen such a, such a search. Um, yep, I think that's that's the. Uh, I mean that that that's the main difference, right? The missing energy. Mm -hmm. with respect to the our priority violating case. Okay, so in principle, the the both model has the different signatures. I mean, can be yeah, searched in yeah. different ways, or can be possible to distinguish both. I, I yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question is. And I have one here that I noted with my hand that is, uh, if, I mean, maybe this is not a question about your talk exactly, but uh, if you know if you know about what happened in other kind of CISO mechanism, instead to have single dry-handed neutrino, you have a triplet leptons or whatever that can oh, can have um, other, no other type of effect. <laughs> no idea at all. I think this is not really feasible on the type 2 CISO, but I'm not really sure. But yeah, I, ha I haven't really uh, uh, considered other CISO models. I think that there have been some works on the type 3 uh, CISO scenario. So yeah, I would expect something over there too. Um, but I wouldn't know about the type 2. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, uh, we have a fast question from Diego that he's asking, what happened with the flavor? Maybe what's related yeah. with the yeah yeah no there, there's the there's uh, he's completing the question afterwards what happens ah. with the flavor of the final charge lepton in inverse hierarchy case ah okay okay sorry oh, oh no. well no. no that's that's basically what what I what I said previously um, there you can have the electron uh, coming out with 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 larger rates than the ones maybe we can go back to to hey, you can show your slides if you if you need. Yeah, let's see. Let me go back to those of the branching ratio. So, am I sharing the screen or are you sharing the screen? Can you actually see me? Yeah, I can see you, but you have to turn off your camera and, and share your screen. Okay, let me let me do that. Turn camera off. Let me uh, screen share. Okay, so do you see the do you see this? Yes. Yeah, yeah we saw. Okay, so so here, um, what we see, for instance, is uh, the the green curve, right? Is the one that involves a muon. Then you have the, the the sorry, the orange curve giving you the muon. Then you have the green one involving taus. And then down here, right, the red gives you the electrons. This is due mainly uh, uh, to the structure of the mixing. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, okay, so here we see why why this is this is the case, right? So for instance, if we replace here, say uh, on the active heavy mixing, electron to one, right? E one, which is a mixing between the electron and the the heavy neutrino, you find that what you care about here is the 1-3 uh, element of the PMNS matrix. So that is sine 1-3. So that's why this is very much suppressed with respect to the other flavors, right? With respect to 2-3 or 3-3, three, three, which are much larger. Now, if you go into the inverted hierarchy, this, this changes. I'm not exactly sure what was uh, the prediction for the inverted hierarchy. I think that you had a, a two three element here for the sorry uh, an L two element here, right? So here then uh, the the column of the PMNS matrix that is involved uh, is is different, right? So here you have a much more democratic distribution between the flavors. This is just a problem of the normal hierarchy. So I'm 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 hoping I I was clear on this. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Diego can give a thumb up about the, the answer of the okay, question. Okay, maybe maybe. But, maybe yeah. Okay. So we still have more questions here. So one is one that by mistake. Uh, Selected, but it was not. I didn't ask. Was the uh, maybe it's a kind of gossip about the experimental side? Is what is the status of this displaced vertex analysis? Because it's kind of it's not so popular to do it now currently. Yeah. Or in the previous analysis at the LAC, they haven't done. So, yeah, so there is so, some. So, yeah. 
on, on previous analysis, they have all, all considered very high mass particles decaying. So that's why they didn't uh, worry too much uh, with uh, the uh, with the triggers, right? With the muon triggers. So all of the things, all of the constraints, uh, had very high PT, right? Had very high PT requirements. Uh, now that the Higgs is has been found to be lightish, right? Um, people are considering this kind of of the case, not only into uh, into heavy neutrinos, but also into hidden valley particles or some other things that I don't really know about. But all of these things share the same feature that they are light and their uh, final momentum is very, the, 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 the transverse momentum of their final states is very soft. So I have seen recently, say a couple months ago, is some new papers coming out trying to propose new triggers. Uh, how uh, this, um, is being taken by the experimental collaborations, I don't know. I'm hoping to, to talk with, with somebody involved in these things in the coming weeks, but I really, at the moment, uh, I'm unable to, to tell you how the experimental collaborations are taking this into account. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So with, in the future, we will know. Yeah, we will, know, we will know for sure. <laughs> for sure, for sure, yeah, yeah. So, so the situation right now has been, unfortunately, not very encouraging since most of the searches have been focusing on very large mass particles. Mm -hmm. So an, another few small question is if these CP phases in the neutrino sector may have a role, take a not, role in, not this in this kind of, not in this case of observables. Not, not in displaced vertices because you don't have, have any interference effects here. Mm -hmm. So then it's just a moduli squared and that's about it. Now, there's there's an interesting thing. Actually, no, actually, I, this, this is something, no. This is, this is, let me correct myself. So let's go back to my slide. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm doing this to you. So let's see, let me turn off my camera. Okay, let me share my screen, desktop, and let's go back to the slides. Okay, so, so here you see the active heavy mixing again. Do you, do, does everybody see this? Yes, I guess everybody okay. is looking at that. So, so here, what, what you can see, actually, is that uh, the mixing will, will involve the, the phases of different uh, PMNS uh, elements, right? So here, what I'm, when, I, when I'm uh, talking about the PMNS matrix, I'm also including the Majorana phases, right? So when you square this, you might have some... Uh, interference effects between one part and the other. Of course, mm -hmm. since you have the suppression of the of the neutrino masses, this is not very very encouraging, but in principle you could get some effect due to the interference between these these elements. But that's as as much as I can as I can tell you. Now the the Higgs decay on the other hand uh, let me show you. The Higgs decay depends on this Cij element. Mm -hmm. Right, so CIJ doesn't depend on the PMNS matrix at all. It's only the posterior decay of the neutrino, of the heavy neutrino, which might have some very small sensitivity to the CP phases. Right, but um, so so for instance, this might be measurable with W, uh, with the Ws, but not with the Higgs. But still, it, I expect this to be a very small effect. Ah, okay, so yeah, it's, it's in, pr in principle a small effect. Yeah. It may be important, maybe in the case if you go to hi very high energies, like in the leptogenesis and scenarios, because usually at that point everything is is available at the energy. <laughs> the energy scale is so large that you can have it. Yeah. So I don't know if the the rest of the people has some other question for for Joel. I'm just let me check if Twitter we have some questions there. No, it seems that we don't have. I don't know, uh, Nicolas or Juan Carlos, Federico or Diego, if you have some many questions. I guess no. So okay. let's start to close the this webinar. So first of all, I want to remind to everybody to. Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, Joel for this nice webinar, and also to remind that. If you want to 
contact us for any doubt, suggestion, comments, or, or if you want to propose a webinar that we can host. In in this size, you can see the Twitter address or Twitter address and our Gmail address in, in, in order to contact. So I, I then. I hope that you have enjoyed this webinar and don't forget also to subscribe to our YouTube channel in which you can find all the previous webinars and you can watch it again and maybe to have some questions, you can address questions directly with the speaker. And I hope to, to see you again in the next Latin American webinar of, of physics that in principle is going to be the 7th of October where the speaker is going to be Diego Aristizabal from the University of Liege and he will talk about something related with leptogenesis many of the questions that I was doing before to Joel. So, Fantastic. see you in the next opportunity and bye to everybody and also to the people that follow this streaming internet.